um, I think I will hand over to Ed, a brief intro, Ed uh, is a medicinal chemist uh, lead at uh, ASAP. Um, he also led the uh, medicinal chemistry effort for COVID moonshot, uh, successfully delivering preclinical candidates against the SARS-CoV-2 M Pro, and he will be telling us about um, target chemical profiles. Over to you, Ed. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Alpha. Right, let me uh, share my slides with you. So this this is one of those topics in, in drug discovery that um, <clears throat> it's kind of hard to talk about really, but but pretty essential. So I've it could be incredibly dry uh, just to talk about kind of theoretical target product profiles and target candidate profiles. And we'll go into the, a little bit of the difference between what those are. So what I've done is um, there's going to be a little bit of kind of general introduction, and I'm going to do a work to a worked example with one of the, the projects where we, we're working on uh, in the ASAP COVID uh, team. So without any more ado, this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, so I'm, first of all, PPPs, TCPs, what are they? What's the difference? There's going to be a, a brief sidebar into MERS and SARS, um, which is really necessary as some kind of justification as to why I'm talking about the rest of it. And I'm going to talk a bit about what I consider our ways of working. Um, and that's fairly essential again to frame the whole rest of it. And a bit of learning from SARS-CoV-2, what did we learn? And then I'm gonna work through these two. And finally, because of the way we work, I'm gonna ask you for feedback, which you don't have to provide in the moment. In fact, we probably won't get time for it, um, but it, obviously get in touch with me or any of the other ASAP team and we'd love to hear what you think. And, and that is a genuine, we want your feedback, not a nominal one. So let's talk about TPPs and TCP. So target product profile, this is the properties of the product, irrespective of how we do it. So if you, we're not in this point concerned about what the mode of action is, we're just concerned with what it looks like kind of in the bottle at the bedside it would be in the end, you can see an evolution of it into being part of an investigator's brochure. And ultimately it's what would end up on the product label, what would end up as the insert in a packet, contraindications, et cetera, how to use it, when to use it. Um, I, at this point, I'll point out that the idea of target product profiles is by no means special to drug discovery. So many industries use something that is the same kind of thing the objective being to get design teams to focus on the client, in our case, patient and clinician, and their needs and not on what you think you can do. So it's all about delivering to a real world outcome, not to just what I think I can do technically, in our case, scientifically. At the next level, a target candidate profile. These are the features of a molecule that we reasonably think will mean it can deliver a target product profile via a particular mode of action. So now we've gone more into the science, further away from the bedside. And obviously many TCPs can deliver the same TPP. So you might have multiple different, in our case, we're talking about different ways of inhibiting viral replication. Any of those might deliver reducing viral replication and therefore better outcomes in a, a virally driven disease, but each one will be specific to a mode of action. Um, there's a really good paper by Jeremy Burrows talking all about a modern paper talk about anti-malarial TCPs and TPPs. I'd recommend that as a read. So this clinical set of outcomes should inform what we write as a TCP, and they in turn require a test cascade. So from the point of view of connecting what we do in terms of running a project, so progressing compounds to a test cascade, we should have line of sight all the way out to what that's going to mean at the bedside. So that's why it matters, because obviously if you've got things specified here and here that aren't in your test cascade, well, you can't deliver them. I mean, this is to some degree obvious, but I think it's worth saying. Okay. So let's take that, that sidebar into why MERS and SARS. So this is um, 60 years of 
coronaviridae crossing over into humans. So this, uh, these are the, um, the different coronaviridae that have, have made it across. You can see that several of them, the particular SARS-1 and 2, um, both SARS-A coronaviruses, both really same beta coronavirus lineage. I've taken the kind of key point here, which is that there are only three of these that really cause serious human disease. Um, OC43 is basically 30% of common cold to this. The others are more inconveniences than lethal. Um, MERS is obviously the standout worrying player here. Um, it's also a beta coronavirus, but it's a different lineage to SARS. Uh, but, you know, it, it does attract one's attention given the fatality rate. Um, when you look into that a little bit more, what's more recently been discovered about MERS, um, so it's endemic now in dromedary camels, and climate change is actually driving people who previously would have used cattle as their, their particular uh, favoured livestock, is pushing them towards camel as a, a better alternative and drier conditions. There is now SARS-CoV-2 and MERS endemic in a number of high population, low middle income countries. And if you think this is just a small problem far away, um, there's half a billion people live in those countries. And so this map shows um, where there is both endemic MERS and camel, basically all across this latitude. Um, it's a airborne respiratory virus, so that's now been established. And when you look at current MPRO inhibitors, MERS is a weak point. So many of the other coronaviridae show broadly equivalent potency with current SARS inhibitors. So whether or not, and this is my point, whether or not we saw a MERS-2 like a SARS-2, if you can't hit the MERS kind of coronavirus and you had either um, a recombination event or just mutation of SARS-2 or a SARS-1 into a more MERS type uh, virus, we wouldn't be able to treat that. So as pandemic risk, it, it, it's there um, because it could happen and currently it wouldn't be easy to treat. So that's the why, why think about MERS. Um, I'm now going to come back to the kind of core of the TPP, TCP argument. And now I'm going to talk a bit about how we've worked in the COVID moonshot, which is where we all started off and now moved into ASAP. And we've got this across lots of our working practices. We see the kind of draft early and refine model. So we take it that good now and improving is better than perfect in six months time. It, depending on where you work, this is all the same thing. So it's the kind of Kaizen continuous improvement. Software developers talk agile rather than waterfall. I quite like this. If you've not read it, it's a cracking read, um, the kind of scout mindset. So, and I think this is, this speaks well to the kind of TPP idea. So let's write an initial TPP, learn more as the science addresses, keep progressing. And I'm gonna show you a real life example of this. Check if the goal is still appropriate, and then you refine the goal and then you alter course and you keep going. So I'm gonna show you TPPs and TCPs that are the best we've got today. And when I say open for improvement, I am expecting that they will change. And that's where, any of you are on the call, if you take exception to something I show you and think, this is not what you should be doing, I don't see why you're the, the rationale for that, don't keep it to yourself, get back to me, we're interested in having that discussion. Okay, let's, let's keep going. So what did we learn from SARS-2? Uh, our ideal would be, we want to suppress at epidemic level before it's this kind of infection, lethal airborne respiratory becomes pandemic. So that has consequences. So you want to be have an orally available agent so you can distribute it rapidly. That could be health worker treatment and protection, kind of cordon sanitaire treatment potentially, pre-exposure prophylaxis. So that, as soon as you start thinking about this top line, the second bullet point I think flows pretty rapidly from it. And then so did the third. So you want to be able to, act, to treat a very wide 
range of the population. Um, and that in itself will then immediately has a range of consequences. So if you think about um, what health worker treatment protecting the broad range of the population means, that means that all women of childbearing age need to be able to be treated. So no carcinogenicity, mutagenicity, teratogenicity risks. It means that you want to be able to treat geriatric patients and others with comorbidities, which means they will be people on multiple other therapies. So drug-drug interactions are going to be to be avoided, especially if you've got sick people, 50 transporter issues, and generally speaking, a highly safe therapy. We've experienced in COVID-19, the kind of pandemic panic hesitancy issues. So what people talk about more nuclear and the vaccine for fertility misinformation. If you've got anything in your, your potential treatment that is going to give people another stick to beat you with in terms of uh, safety profile for a new therapy for an emerging disease, that's going to be problematic. So it's our point of view that we really actually have to, there's no excuse not to make uh, agents that really are as safe as possible, particularly when you consider that, a, again, a new pan or new epidemic, the case fatality rate may not be clear early on. So the cost benefit analysis, if you've got any safety risks, when the benefit is unclear, your costs have got to be really low. OK, so more on how to plan for an unknown disease. So we are focused on direct acting antivirals. And in that case, the model that we're working to is that inhibition of viral replication in multiple model cell lines will generate a relevant EC50. And in particular, this is the kind of pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic model that we're working to, which is that you need continuous in vivo free drug cover in plasma over the cellular EC50. And that's a reasonable model. This is the first working model that we have. So you have, you dose your compound, it's excreted, and you dose it more and it's excreted. But once you get above this efficacy threshold, this is where you would expect to see some therapeutic benefit. And obviously, you want to keep your Cmax well below your toxicity threshold, which will be there. These numbers are uh, irrelevant. This is, this is a cartoon, not a literal case. I just snapped this picture to, because it was a nice description. Um, but it makes a couple of, of assumptions. So we assume our compounds are relatively well distributed, where plasma to tissue ratios are reasonable and where the compound can easily access all the body compartments and tissues where the virus is replicating. So for this to be true, the second two points also need to be true. So it, it's not, there's a little bit more to this than just we need free drug over plasma. And we want to see efficacy in one or more animal models of a similar disease. So in our case, we're seeing MERS as a model for a future lethal respiratory coronavirus. Okay. So that, that gives you a kind of um, worked example of what our scientific thinking is for, for planning out a direct acting antiviral to draw up target product and, and candidate profiles. So let's get into the worked example now. So this is our MERS and SARS project uh, draft as of June. Uh, hasn't been significantly updated since then, so I'm looking for input. And, and I've listed the properties as minimum essential and ideal. Um, so let's let's start talking about those. So we're going to work just through these and I'm going to make some commentary here so that people can, and I've captured all the commentary so that um, if you access this slide, these slides afterwards, you'll be able to read our thinking. So you can imagine an IV agent for use in intensive care unit, but it's not our primary goal. IV plus oral is from a medicinal chemist perspective very hard because they're essentially conflicting goals. You need very high solubility for IV. That can cause problems in terms of oral absorption, uh, particularly in a high dose agent. So we're just sticking with the minimum is oral. Um, I've talked about animal model as a reasonable surrogate for a known disease. We're planning on going with mouse as our in vivo species at the discovery stage, 
there we've looked at hamster which has much higher metabolism than even mouse usually and there are significant problems in terms of logistics with ferret so we these were things we looked at in the covid moonshot and we're um basically reverting to mouse and this is a pretty key point that will come up uh, later on as well um aiming for you know modest to good but at least bioavailability low bioavailability in itself is not an issue unless it becomes variable but you need more and more potent agents fed and fasted is more likely to be a compliance issue again we're thinking this is being used in an emerging epidemic you just want to be able to tell people take the tablets don't tell them it's got to be taken an hour before meals an hour after because you, you just want to be able to say take it it will give you protection or treat you i've already talked about how important it is to be able to uh, treat patients on multiple therapies and where this comes down to is particularly cyp 450 inhibitors because if you inhibit uh, the, the cyps you're potentially going to lead to overdosing of other therapeutics and that may have lethal interactions um, so that's just really not tolerable and say SAEs, serious adverse events again i've already talked about this we can't be putting compounds out there where you're you're potentially either having to monitor for or you're going to get a number of saes uh, that would be very bad and um the whole issue of safety in uh, and contraindication for pregnancy so although conceptually you can see in higher middle income countries that might be possible where you're requiring people to use contraception in lower middle income countries and remember that's where you're we're highly at risk from epidemics initiating contraception is not broadly available so it becomes when contraception isn't broadly available that in itself becomes a contraindication and and being unable to treat with all women of childbearing age i think is a critical failure so i'm th this is a, a no-go for us okay so moving on how does that then translate from a target product profile because this didn't talk about mechanism at all this is all about what the pills look like essentially when we're going towards the clinic now, obviously what you will be looking for is much more than this um but it's an unknown disease so a mouse models are probably as good as you're going to have so how does that translate into a uh, main protease inhibitor of SARS-CoV-2 MERS-CoV-2 so we from our experience you need to be down at ideally in the the low tens of nanomolar for SARS-2 for main protease to deliver this kind of inhibition of viral replication um now that obviously depends on the enzyme cell drop off now we've developed experience in that for SARS um it's really not clear for MERS what that will be or for a new virus. You start off assuming a kind of tenfold drop off and refine that. I'll come towards the end of this uh, talk. I'll show you some of the very, the most recent data we have that suggests maybe for MERS that might not be true. The real goal here, though, is all about the cell assay. So the enzyme is a, a surrogate for the cell, not a target in itself um obviously the more potent an enzyme a, a cellular inhibitor the, the better because our pkpd model is free minimum concentration over ec90 the the easy, the more potent your compounds are the easier this is to achieve given we won't have that much dynamic range on actual pharmacokinetics um this is a work in progress so we would like to see significant reduction in measured animal viral load as a as a bare minimum um what this needs to be i think is a, a really interesting subject for all of us working the avid projects to say what what constitutes a an acceptable outcome in an animal model um 
In terms of spectrum, the reason we've gone with MERS is because it looks like it's about the hardest other coronavirus to inhibit and is the most pathogenic. I talked about that at the beginning. Um, are no PK enhancers here is ritonavir generates a lot of DDIs. So if you're using this or another uh, PK enhancer, that's going to give you a lot of potential issues. We've addressed that repeatedly already. Solubility is, is uh, I think, often the orphan property. Um, in reality, poorly soluble compounds are just a total pain in the neck and they never get better. So they're a flag for poor cellular activity, often lead to poor absorption. We're probably going to want to dose these compounds at quite a high level. So if you've got a poorly soluble compound that then that in that tops out your potential absorption, I don't think that's acceptable. Um, for proteases, obviously using the a protease panel is a target specific risk factor. A non-selective protease inhibitor is going to generate lots of toxicities that will be uh, unacceptable. And so we're flagging that as something we will look at very early on in the test cascade. Um, I've already talked lots about SIPs and transporters, but here they are on our TPP as being no significant DDIs, clean in all five main SIPs, no critical transporter inhibition. And our first um, mutagenicity, teratogenicity assay is using an AMOS test. So we're using that as our entry level. We don't want to see any of that. Uh, clearly, there'll be a lot of other reprotox that you would go forward with, but that's the first reasonable cellular system I think you can use. Obviously, you would flag other things if you saw them as toxicities and investigate them, but that's a key one to have early on. So how does that then translate into a test cascade, which is what we really use for directing the, um, the program? So I've drawn up this table here, and here's a kind of fairly conventional test cascade. In green is what we are running live now. In orange is my, my work for by the end of the week is to submit our first set of compounds into to tier one admet. And then obviously compounds are gonna progress through this test cascade. And this choice of wanting efficacy studies and then choosing to do them in the mouth, then propagates back up through the test cascade. And you can see this. So basically our tier one admet will be looking at stability in mouse microsomes as our first assessment, because we want to do uh, efficacy studies in mouse. And as we come down, so our tier two in vitro admet has then mouse hepatocytes and protein binding in mouse. Our first in vivo pharmacokinetics is mouse again. Our tier two in vivo admet is mouse bioavailability. So you can see all the way through, we have a line here that is worrying about making sure we can actually get that oral bioavailability in a mouse from the start. But on the side, or rather in parallel, we're building our prediction of human dose because all the time what we're really trying to do is get what's our cover going to be over the cellular IC50. The cellular IC50, of course, is right here at the top of the cascade in parallel with in vitro activity, and we have that up and running. So that's that's how I see you go from thinking about what are we going to actually use this, how are we going to use this in a patient, through how are we going to define what kind of compounds can we nominate, all the way through to the, the working daily life in a project of what's my test cascade, which compounds go into what first. And it's actioning this through that hopefully at the end leads us to compounds with the right measured properties. So that's, that's the connection all the way from TPP, TCP to um, actual compounds. And, and because I'm a chemist, I have to show structures. It's, it's, it's the law. Um, and this is just some very early data that we've got where we're measuring SARS-2 and MERS data. And in particular, we've started to generate some cell data. And this is one of the things I wanted to talk about was we may want to go back and revise what our perception is of um, 
enzyme cell drop off on the basis that we're probably seeing a bit less than 10. So it may be that we can slacken off our MERS enzyme target, um, maybe, uh, because it looks like for MERS, it's not quite as bad. Now, that's there's a lot of questions about this data. It's very, it, it's early breaking data. Most of this, uh, these, you know, nemeltrevir, these are literature compounds. This is an early moonshot compound. This is a very late moonshot compound that's super potent against SARS. Looks like it works a bit against MERS as well. And we can see it at the start of some activity in MERS. So this is, as I said, I wanted to give an example of how we might be revising our TPP on the basis as we understand the science better. I'm aware I've got a couple of minutes left, um, but this is my formal call for feedback. Um, if you're drawing up TPPs, TCPs for your projects um, in AVID, we'd love to talk to you about how you do that. You've seen a bit of how, about how we do it, um, especially if you're working on MERS and you know, the other human coronaviruses, but MERS is our, our front, uh, SARS-MERS is our front running project. I'm interested in how are you considering your efficacy targets? What are your safety criteria? Do you think we've been too harsh? Do you think we've been too lax? Do you think we should be more severe? And then how are you doing that translation for these targets into your actual test cascades? Uh, I think I've finished possibly with a minute or two to spare. Um, I don't know if there's time for me to answer any questions or whether we're doing that today or... Yes, uh, thank, thanks so much, Ed. Uh, really, really exciting talk. Um, so we still have a few minutes. So let's uh, dive into a quick Q&A around this, uh, your talk, and then we could move on to the healer case, and then we could do a more general uh, panel discussion. So I think we, we have two questions, one from Anne Aiken um, on... Uh, adding something about PKPD to the MERS TPP and criteria about plasma coverage of EC90, a uh, free EC90, uh, lung exposure, um, and rapidly hitting these PKPD target, um, rather getting steady state in hours rather than days. Uh, do you have any comments on that? Ed? Um, so in terms of, let me let me see if I got those two questions because you you whistled through them quite fast. Um, so in terms of lung exposure. We've done that in the moonshot. So we've looked at lung to plasma. Um, I think it's certainly a very reasonable thing for us to factor back in, probably lower down the cascade, um, probably in parallel with, I guess if we didn't see efficacy in a mouse model with what looked like a compound with fairly reasonable volume of distribution, you'd be adding a volume of distribution around, you know, between 0.8 and 3. Uh, lung, lung fluid is slightly acidic, so it looks like bases may preferentially distribute slightly into lung. Discuss. Um, we'd probably go back and do it as a diagnostic, and then in terms of developability, I don't think we put lung plasma lung levels in as a, a high level part of the cascade, just because it's quite an intense experiment. I think the the other thing that we see from um, certainly the, I think Shinogi showed this was that you really don't want to have a compound holiday. So in terms of that 24 hour cover, was that the second question? Is uh, Rapidly hitting uh, steady state in hours rather than days. Is, is oh, time yeah, yeah. I, no, I want to be there in hours. Days is not, a, days is not acceptable. Okay. Um, and how does that affect I, I think, the cascade? Uh, well, rapidly hitting steady state, I don't think it's the steady state that matters. I think it's being above the EC90 quickly that matters. Because right. to rapidly hit the steady state, you actually would want a fast excretion. And I don't want that. I want, I want the compounds to come in, get over the EC90 and stay above there. But I want to achieve that. I mean, ideally in the first dose. Um, so right. I think that's, that's our thinking. But it, Thank you very much indeed for, for asking the questions. I think and that's probably me over time, Alpha. Then I think a related question maybe uh, uh, from Phil Sanderson is why use power availability, not dose in the TPP? 
I, I was going to put a dose in there as well on the basis. I think for a TPP, it's as much as you can swallow. You know, it's it's that, you know, we're, we're talking about that level for pandemic preparedness. But if you have a really low bioavailability compound, then the potential is it's going to be highly variable. So you get, then you're going to see different effects in your population and maybe not see good efficacy. Whereas if you've got high bioavailability, but you're having to take a gram and a half or two grams a day, what the hell, everybody will be treated. You're just going to have to rack out a lot of compounds. So I think it is bioavailability is the right target um, because I worry about, bio, about variability. But, but it's a great question. Thank you for, for asking. Yeah, thanks so much for the question. Thanks, thanks again, Ed, for uh, this amazing, this great talk on uh, TPP and TCPs. Getting us uh, thinking about this.